Okay. A few announcements regarding schedules. Since it is a little bit, it is indeed a little bit tight having the, the final report for this tower test. And I do want you to do a good job. You need to carefully study. And we haven't posted the videos yet. We're going to post, um, I don't know if I'll make it this afternoon. It depends whether I can handle the PHP on my own. But we will post them on the web uh, on the, you know, where there, there's a, a tab for projects, right? And under that, there'll be a, a little link, and it'll link to all the videos. So you'll be able to go up there and download your little video. And although the resolution isn't the best, maybe you can zoom in full screen and carefully squint your eyes and see what member failed first. You could even pull some screen captures off, perhaps, to explain. The idea is that you, you study the failure a little bit and decide what the, what the, the scenario was, how it failed. Whether in a lot of them, I mean, what were the options? A single member broke, right? That happened. May have happened to you. <laughs> or the whole column buckled. So a lot of them did that. Some of them, the joints came apart and the weight went straight down and the, <laughs> the column split to either side. That was a pretty exciting. Some of them failed torsionally, spiraled down when we did this morning, did that. Anyway, look at it and visually describe how it failed and, and you know, how you might have made it stronger. You know, whether it would have been uh, additional X bracing against the torsional effect or maybe uh, shorter uh, or less slender members so they didn't buckle or less slender columns so the whole thing didn't buckle. You know, try to, try to describe what you th think the, the uh, demise of your <laughs> column was. Even though, I mean, some of them carried an astronomical amount. I mean, I think this is certainly a record. What did, we, what did you say, 300-something pounds was the, holy smoke. I don't know where you came up. Well, you must have stood on it. Did you, well, you put Matthew on it. How did you get 300? Like two Matthews. <laughs> Both Matthew Both. And, and Thomas. Well, I don't know how you came Where did you get that much weight? We didn't have that much weight. We just started stripping a lot of the <laughs> Point prying up tiles out there. Okay. So that's pretty phenomenal. That is certainly a record. It's probably, I guess we were a little bit higher this semester because the balsa would, was a little stronger. The weight to strength ratio on balsa is actually better than, than um, basswood, which is interesting. You think basswood, and basswood is maybe ultimately stronger, but the balsa is so light, its weight to strength ratio is better. Um, anyway. So, and you could comment on the material. A few of you use the tissue paper um, or the balsa, word versus, balsa versus basswood and different techniques. So, anyway, uh, we'll say that's going to be due not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, which is not the, um, let's see, this Wednesday is the 11th. We'll say it's due on the 18th, March 18th. Am I getting this right? That's not this, this, today's the 9th, the 11th is this Wednesday, following Wednesday is the 18th. So they'll be due on the 18th in recitation. You just give them to your one copy. You don't have to, don't have to make copies for each GSI. No, just one copy. Um, and does it include the initial report? Does the final report? I think, yeah, yeah, you should in, respond to, it should include that initial report. Some, somebody didn't pick, out the, pick up their initial report, uh, which they better do because you should include that, I mean, either as a preface or an appendix <laughs> somewhere it's supposed to be included in the, the uh, final report with maybe some of response to it since it had comments on it. Right? Make sense? Okay. So you do that. Uh, today we're going to go on with concrete this week. and. Uh, Seems like we spend a lot of time in concrete, a lot of time on concrete in here, but concrete is an interesting, it gets under your fingernails, you know, it's an interesting material. Um, and there's a lot you can do with it. This is actually a building I built. I had, you know, I, we've been redoing these lectures so I can only put in 
there was a, there was a prettier picture there <laughs> last year, <laughs> one that Fry Otto and, and uh, who did he do it with? Um, not Gutbrot, oh, some other architect, I can't remember, uh, did for the Stuttgarter uh, Bahnhof design. Uh, but this is one I, uh, this one I did uh, a few years ago was a, a, um, a shell that we made, and this was, it had a thin concrete shell underneath it, then we put the reinforcing on, and then it was uh, gunited with uh, pneumatically applied concrete. You have a, like a big fire hose that blasts concrete onto it, uh, and it, it, if it's done properly, it, it, uh, it gets fairly high strength concrete because it's impacted, it kind of um, gets the air out of it as it impacts. Uh, and it's, um, anyway, that's what that was about. We'll talk about, this, uh, this, there's a lot of things we can talk about here. Whoops, whoops, hit the wrong button, but yeah, we'll talk about this. <laughs> we, we had a concrete chapter, right? You'd think you would have had enough concrete. Uh, the concrete that we did uh, a few weeks ago, we did by the allowable stress method, uh, or, or in concrete, what they call working stress design, uh, WSD. This was the method that was used exclusively um, back in the, up until probably 80-something. Uh, I think it changed in 82, if I'm right, or right about then. Um, and they, they changed it because the uh, ultimate strength method uh, uses the safety factors in a, in a slightly different way that allows you to um, more fine-tune the safety factor. In, in allowable stress design, or WSD, there is this one single safety factor um, that gets placed on the, on the uh, cylinder load. You know, the F prime C comes from a, a test. I like this. You can look at it in a second. Um, and that gets modified in working stress design uh, by a single safety factor. This is the, the same philosophy as what we used with steel. You know, you had the yield strength and you put like 0 0.6 or 0 0.66 or, you know, something, a safety factor on that, that yield strength. In wood, it's actually the same. There, there's a, uh, an allowable uh, load and it gets modified a little bit by different factors, but there's a, a basic uh, allowable stress that you compare to the actual calculated stress. So in, in uh, working stress design, this stress came from MC over I. It was the basic flexure for flexure. Um, uh, and, and the premise is for MC over I to be valid, you have to have a, a linear uh, stress strain relationship. Here, turn, turn that on a little bit there. Whoop. Concrete, actually, if you, we look at the stress versus the strain, it's not really a very linear material. It, it looks more like that. Or higher strength concretes might even dip faster something like that. They tend to fail at, at approximately the same strain. Um, and they have different, different ultimates. This would be the F prime C value. Initially, in this lower range down here, you can kind of see that they're straighter. And the assumption that we made with, with this method was that we'd stay in this lower range and that we'd use, we'd pretend that, the, that it really was linear, that that stress strain was linear, and then we did use MC over I. In, the, in the, this other method, in ultimate strength, you really look at the, the values out here, and it's way beyond this, uh, there's really no way you can, can call that linear anymore. Um, and as a result, you cannot use MC over I. 
you have to develop the equations based on an internal uh, moment couple, which we'll see in a second. But that's, a, that's probably the biggest philosophic difference. This one, in, in the end, they become very close. I mean, you, you, you're using, at ultimate strength, you're, you're basing it on the strength out here, but then you, put a, you do put a, uh, a factor of safety on it, which brings it back down to a, a similar range, approximately the same. I mean, both methods give comparable results. Uh, it's not like you get wildly different results. That wouldn't make too much sense that you'd, you'd be able to design your building by one method and get a totally different answer if you designed it by the other method. They're fairly similar. What, what tends to be the distinction, the, the, because you were remaining in this, the, the equations kind of forced you down into this range, you tended to have heavier members. They were uh, bulkier. Uh, so that the concrete didn't, the stresses in the concrete didn't go as high because the area is bigger, the volume of concrete's bigger. So you tend to have uh, a little bit heavier members with, with this. Uh, with the, the uh, ultimate strength design, you can get, um, the members tend to be a little bit lighter. That means they also are a little more flexible. They're a little bit bouncier. They're not quite as stiff, but that they're still within uh, obviously designed within the, the limits of the uh, code. Now, here, shut that, go back to the other light here. Uh, if, you look at, if you look at this method, this is, this is the one that we're going to cover this week. Um, this, is a, this is a newer uh, approach. Like I said, it changed about in the 70s. That, that may not sound terribly new to you, but <laughs> in the scope of, I guess, the history of concrete, it's not that it's okay, it's getting on. <laughs> but um, the idea was that because you know the dead load in concrete in particular, you know the dead load, well, it, you always know the dead load fairly accurately, but in concrete in particular, the dead load is a significant amount of the load. Uh, with steel, with wood, it's almost insignificant. The amount of dead load in the structure from wood, because wood is so light, is not so appreciable. I mean, think of the wood towers that you just made. Four ounces compared to 300 pounds, my goodness. I mean, there's, the dead load was insignificant in that case. Um, all right, maybe it's in typical uh, buildings, it's not that, that big of a, a difference. But still, the dead load's not as big a part of the total load. For steel, it's a little bit more. But still, steel, uh, for the amount of load it carries, Steel is fairly light. Um, it's a fairly strong material, so, so really, uh, uh, in fact, uh, you've seen these um, uh, sheet metal stud walls. Those come out to be lighter than wood uh, as, a, as a light framing. And, and if you had to replace the steel in this structure <laughs> with wood, wood members, you'd have a lot. You wouldn't just have them spaced. Uh, 36 feet apart, they'd be closer together, and they'd be they'd be pretty beefy. So they might end up being heavier, in fact, than than the steel. Steel's fairly light for a framing system. Concrete, on the other hand, is pretty. I mean, there's no way around it. Concrete is heavy, and it doesn't span that far, not as far as steel generally. So so you have pretty a pretty significant amount of weight, and even though the in a beam you may have a very deep section. There's a, a lot of weight that's not really contributing to the strength. Everything below the neutral axis is in tension, right, in a beam. And that's not really, it's just dead weight. It's just dead weight out there. So, so there's a lot of dead weight in, in a concrete structure. So since it is an appreciable part of the, the uh, load, it, it, you, you have an advantage if you uh, tune your safety factor to, to take into account that you know that very accurately. There, uh, one of the big things that the safety factor does is accounts for the um, uh, lack of precision with which you really are able to predict your structure. Uh, predict it maybe through the equations, predict it through the material, the properties of the material, also predict it in terms of the loads that are going to be on it, like the live loads. I mean. The live load's a very statistical kind of thing. Whether your bedroom really has 40 PSF on it, mm, yeah, maybe. Or, or an office has 50 PSF on it, 
you know, on, it could at some point in its history, but probably not every day. And maybe, maybe there's some offices that have 60 PSF, I don't know. But um, anyway, you know that live load less accurately than you do the dead load. The dead load you know fairly precisely. All you have to do, I mean, the building's built. It's not going to get fatter or something or, or go on a diet and get lighter. No, once you build it, that's pretty much it. So uh, you can calculate the weight of it. It's just a matter of summing up the, the, the members, the weights of the members, and then you know it. It's fairly precise, that, that uh, calculation. So you don't really need as large a safety factor. So what, what the big difference here is they split the safety factors. Instead of having one, there are two safety factors. There's a gamma factor that's applied to the loads. And these are, these are actually the old values. They changed them, I think, around 2005, um, I think is when they changed. Uh, our book still has these values. So I put these values up here because it matches the textbook. I think this one's gone to 1.6. This one is something else. I don't think that's right either. But anyway, but it, in principle, it's pretty much the same. Uh, you can see that the dead load uh, at 1.4, now this is, this is applied to the loads. So these numbers are all greater than 1. You're, you're, to make the load safe, you're increasing it, right? You increase the loads. So we're saying uh, we'll, up the, we, you know, we'll put a 40% safety factor on the loads. We'll put a 70% safety factor on the, I mean, on the dead load, on the live load. Uh, wind load is uh, a little less because it, this was because the winds were actually calculated a little bit high, and it was always in conjunction with other loads, so that's why that was low. Uh, when you use them in combination, uh, then they, they retain their own individual safety factor. So dead load plus live load uh, you separate the, the safety factor. That way you can, you can reduce the safety factor on the, um, on the dead load. And then there's a, there's a little bit of an advantage here. It, you know, rather than putting like 1.7 on everything, you can reduce this. You can see it like that. You reduced it by 30%. That 30% savings on dead load uh, would make your structure uh, a little bit lighter. And what you're doing is, it's not like you're making it less safe. You're just fine-tuning the design a little bit. You're sharpening your pencil, so to speak, and getting a little more. I mean, it's a little more hassle to do all this, but it's uh, a little more precise. On the other side, we still put a safety factor on the um, the stress or on the members. Actually, put it on the the strength side uh, or the force side, meaning the uh, uh, the moment, the shear uh, force V. The, the column P, oh, here they are. Uh, so uh, the, you calculate the moment. This is the, um, the moment, the strength moment, or the moment coming from the member itself. Uh, you reduce that by 10%, 0.9. And that has to be larger than the, the moment that uh, comes from the loads, the WL squared over 8 or something, that moment, which has then these safety factors. So these safety factors go with the U. They're on this side. And these safety factors, the, the phi factors, uh, go on this side. So you've got, you've got two, two sets. Yeah, actually, they're sets because inside of each set, there are several different safety factors. So there are two sets of safety factors, the, the gamma factors and the phi factors. Uh, and you can see they, they get applied like that. Steel now is done. Uh, the same way. Steel changed in, um, they came out with a steel code in 90, I think, 1990, if I remember right, um, was the first LRFD. And there they call it, this is the steel designation, uh, load resistance factor design. Um, and with steel, it's kind of a toss-up whether you, whether you really gain anything. And uh, they had, I think when it initially came out, they hoped everybody would change over. But it was one of those things like everybody was going to change over to the metric system, right? And there was great uh, expectation that didn't really occur. I don't think most offices looked at it and figured, well, this is kind of complicated. <laughs> and you got the same values as, as you did, more or less as you did with the allowable stress design. So a lot of people stuck with allowable stress design. So now the steel manual publishes both. 
they combined them for a while, and now I think they've, in the latest code, they actually published an ASD code. This was a, for steel, this is called ASD, and this is LRFD. So you've kind of got both going on simultaneously. In wood, uh, I think just about everybody uses ASD, but there is a published LRFD. They kind of published it along with the same code. And the part of the reason for doing that is uh, if you're in a, well, two reasons maybe. If you're in an office and you're, you're doing one kind, you tend to just do all the code, all the, all the calculations the same, just so you're, it's more comfortable. So you decide, we're going, if we do a lot of concrete, we'll do this anyway, and we might as well do all the steel like that, and we'll do the wood like that too, if we ever do any wood. And then you could just stick with LRFD, and that means you're, your load calculations could always be the same. You could keep these gamma factors, no matter what, what material, they'd all plug into the same. So there's some, um, uh, something to be said for consistency in that regard. Now, let's see, what else can we say? Here, turn, turn the lights on. This, the, the, this we saw before. Uh, well, wait a minute, turn the lights off. <laughs> <laughs> turn, turn them off. Turn them on. Don't, no, no, turn them off. Uh, we saw this slide before with the the um, when we looked at WSD, and uh, it's exactly the same in that regard for how where the the basic stress comes from is exactly the same for both codes. There is a cylinder. Uh, this is cast um, at the site uh, according to a fairly strict ASTM. I think in that film they may have even showed. That being done, it comes out. It has to come from like a certain batch out of a truck. You truck pulls up, and it can't be the very first. It's like the the middle third of the truckload or something. And they pour it into a wheelbarrow, and then they cast uh, uh, some statistical number depending on the volume of these. I think they're usually three or well, maybe they're more than that. Six for uh, a truckload of concrete, um, and then these are cured 28 days, and then they're tested. And the strength that comes from this test, this is a compression test that gives you F prime C. They just load it up until it breaks, and that's it. And normally, you're only interested in that crushing strength. That F prime C is one number, and that's all you get out of the test. If you want to, you could, you could get the, this little device that's on here is recording the strain. And that would then allow you to give a, a, a stress-strain curve. I suppose in, in modern testing labs, they probably just do this by, it's hooked up to a computer nowadays. When I used to do this, we had to, you have to stand there and physically read the numbers off, so you, you normally didn't do it. But I suppose it's not much trouble now to do it. Uh, this is what it looks like after failure. They usually have a diagonal break. Uh, the concrete shatters like this. This, this thing that you see here, this, this is a uh, sulfur cap, or some sort of plastic maybe, but usually sulfur. You, melt sulfur, a sulfur compound, and, and pour it molten onto the, into a little mold so you get a, a dead flat surface. So it's, so it's perfectly smooth, and then you get a consistent test out of that. The, the tensile test is a little bit different. It's done on the side. It's also done at 28 days, and it's, done, it's uh, about 10 to 20 percent less. Now you can turn the lights on. Now, looky here. When I went down to see my, my dear old dad, he, he, he reminded me that I still had some of my childhood toys that I left among them this. And this was, a, this was a cylinder I cast back when I was probably your age and used to play. This, this is how I amused myself. I just went out in the backyard, cast a cylinder. Right? This is one I never got around to testing. <laughs> but and it, this is the form. I just split it off this morning after after 20 years of sitting in my father's backyard, <laughs> he said, you know, that thing's still sitting out there. Actually, there are about 20 of them sitting out there. <laughs> and I told him, well, you probably need the other ones. <laughs> I'll just take this one. Um, so when you do a, a compression test, it'd go like this. The tensile test, they actually put on the side. Uh, they set like that, and you put a little strip of wood, probably top and bottom, and, and it gets crushed. And the the... Uh, the way the force is developed, the compression runs this way, and the principal tensile stress is always at 90 degrees to the compression. So there's a principal uh, tension force that goes like this. 
So when you, when you uh, load it, it actually splits right down the center and, and just splits right in half. And that splitting uh, is from tension, actually. It doesn't crush. It, it splits on, on when you load it like this. And that it's, does it almost right in half. You can do the same trick with an apple, by the way. Maybe I'll demonstrate. I didn't bring an apple with me. This was, this was what I learned last year. I mean, every year you try and learn one new trick. And, and so I was at a conference with a bunch of guys. They're all engineers. And this guy, and they, for lunch, they passed out apples. So this guy picks up his apple. He says, have you ever seen this? And he holds it like this and goes, ay <laughs> And split it in half. Just, I mean, just, and it split cleanly right in half. I said, man, teach me how to do that. <laughs> so that's what, <laughs> see, taught me how to do that. <laughs> but I can't do it with a concrete cylinder. It won't work. <laughs> I couldn't do it. Hey, oh! Okay, now you're going to hang on to uh, test my skill. Okay. I don't know if I can really do it. Now watch, I'll make a liar. I haven't done it in, in weeks. Oh, almost. Whoa! There you go. <laughs> okay. So now you can try that yourself. Right? This is a tensile split on an apple. <clears throat> All right, so <laughs> I can only do it once a day. It wore me out. OK, now turn the lights back off before I recover. Uh, so that's a little bit about concrete testing. Now, the failure of it in, in, uh, in the field in a beam, it's a little bit different uh, than it is in, in the uh, cylinder. And uh, it's reinforced for one thing. And the reinforcing has, uh, of course, affects its behavior quite a bit. Um, what you like, and we probably discussed this when we talked even about the WSD. Yeah, I'm sure we did. We, we looked at, at Rho then. Um, it's very important for concrete beams, for beams, to fail ductily, to fail safely. You could put, um, I mean, well, let, let, let's look at the different scenarios. Uh, if you had no reinforcing in a beam, this is all looking at a beam. If you had a beam and it had no reinforcing in it at all, what would happen? You'd load it up, you'd get that it would fail in tension at the bottom, presumably first. It's much weaker in, in tension, so it's going to crack at the bottom. And that crack's going to shoot right up it. And there's nothing that will stop the crack. Once the crack starts, it'll just go. Because as it cracks, the area gets less. Well, if it, I mean, if you have a full section and it failed, if you, because of the cracking, you've got less than a full section, it's going to fail even more, right? So unless that load disappears somehow uh, instantly, as soon as the crack starts, it's catastrophic. The crack just shoots right straight through it, and the thing collapses instantly. You have a, you can imagine, it like any brittle material. If it were made out of glass, you know, what would you think? When it, when it breaks, it breaks, and the whole thing. Well, this is not a very convenient way to break in a building. If you're, if you're standing in a building, and if somebody's upstairs uh, doing some sort of overload action. I don't know, they're testing towers and they've hauled in all these uh, steel weights or I don't know what and they drop it on the floor and it cracks the beam. You don't want to be underneath and say, oh my, and have the whole thing cra crash down on you, you'd be dead. So that's not a very good uh, failure scenario. If you have a little bit of steel in there, let's say um, actually there's an amount less than this Okay, less than that amount. This is say say you put two piano wires in in that you got this big concrete beam and you put these two little fine strands of steel in it. That's a joke. That's not going to do anything. When the when the crack starts, that steel is so small it'll just snap, right? And when it snaps, it's like it wasn't there. So there's a there's a minimum amount of steel that you have to have to stop that initial crack so that when it cracks, it doesn't just shoot right through it. And that, that minimum amount of steel is represented by this. 
and they put it in terms of rho because it is actually, it's, it's a proportion. It depends on how big the beam is. You know, how much, how much steel, it's a percentage of the steel, a percentage of the beam as to uh, how much you need. So for, for that minimum to, to stop a catastrophic failure, this would be a minimum amount that you'd need. You'd calculate 200 over Fy. This is Fy for the steel. And that's usually uh, either the lowest strength would be a grade 40. The typical strength is either grade 60 or grade 75, maybe. Usually grade 60. Um, so this would be 200 over 60 would be a row. And that would be then uh, equal to ASBD. You'd calculate the, the side. This is B and D of the beam, uh, the, the width and the depth down to the steel. And then you could see exactly how much the area of steel that that would be for the beam. That would be the minimum amount of steel you'd need. Maybe a, maybe a half an inch, maybe whatever it comes out to be, uh, it would uh, give you some amount of steel. Now, if you put, when, when that fails at that minimum amount, the crack starts, but the steel just holds it. Okay, It's just enough to hold it so the crack doesn't go all the way through. If you put more load on it, that steel's going to stretch. But it's, it's, it can't hold very much. It'll stretch a little bit, and then it'll snap, and then it'll fail. But at least it stretches. It does hold it, and it stretches initially. And remember, steel has an incredible amount of stretch. In, and it doesn't take much to, to allow something, to a beam, to deflect a lot. Even a very, you have to realize it's stretching not just at one point probably, but it cracks in several places. So the steel's stretching in different places. And it doesn't take much stretch to allow the beam to sag. And it, that sagging is a, is a red flag. <laughs> not a yellow flag, it is a red flag. <laughs> if you see a concrete beam, little particles of dust falling out of it. <laughs> it's sagging down, making kind of crackly noises. This is not a time to stand there and take pictures of it. You should be like out the door very quickly. Uh, and it, but it does give you a little bit of warning, you know, time to run. That's running time. Uh, now, if you put more steel in it, you, you eventually come up. You know, the more steel you put in it, uh, the stronger it gets. So that like, if I have, compared to the minimum amount, let's say I double the minimum amount. I got twice as much in there. Well, then I've got to put more load on it, it's going to deflect more uh, before it, it fails. It would still you know, stretch the steel, and eventually the steel would, would snap. So I keep putting more steel in it, and it, it would deflect in even further, but eventually the steel would snap. At some point, I mean, you can imagine if you go to the extreme, I just put tons and tons and tons and tons of steel in the bottom of it. Until it's all full of steel on the bottom. Well, the steel may not fail anymore. Then what would happen? If you put so much steel in it, it didn't fail, then you'd be, then you'd be down, down here, actually. Uh, and the, the, the concrete on the top would fail in compression before the steel would fail. Because the concrete, ultimately, is weaker than the steel. The steel, we're talking 60 KSI, right? 60,000 PSI. The concrete's maybe four, right? <laughs> 4,000 PSI. You know, 4,000 compared to 60,000, a, it's a way down the scale. So if you, you can easily have enough steel in there that the steel's going to be stronger than the concrete and push it to the concrete failing on the top. Well, somewhere there's a balance point. Somewhere you could have just enough steel and just the right strength of concrete so that just as the steel was starting to yield, the steel starting to stretch, the concrete is, is crushing in, in compression. That would, be, that would be balanced. The steel's failing, or it, it actually doesn't fail, but it's at the yield point, just as the concrete crushes. And that would be a perfectly balanced beam. That's what's defined as balanced, uh, actually defined by that equation, which we'll look at in a minute. Now, in, in um, in allowable strength design, this balance was calculated slightly differently because we assumed that this was linear. And actually, you were down in a much lower range. <clears throat> so because you were in that lower range, 
you are allowed to actually, you're allowed to design right at balance. But it, in steel, I mean in the ultimate strength design, when we talk about failure, we're really talking about up here with the concrete failure. So balance is not really where you want to be because balance is pretty touchy. <laughs> you know, if you're a little bit wrong, <laughs> balance is not going to be balanced. You, in any case, you definitely don't want the concrete to fail first. Because if the concrete, either on the bottom, I mean, if, if say, the scenario where no steel and the concrete fails, it's just very sudden. If the concrete fails in compression on the top, that's just as sudden. You're standing there, you know, you're minding your own business, you're eating a few sandwiches, people are pulling in steel weights and somehow piling around the floor, and you think, wow, that's pretty interesting. And, and then all of a sudden, they, you know, if, if this, there's so much steel in the bottom of the beam, it's not going to fail. If the top of the beam fails, you're standing on the top of the beam, let's say, it explodes. The whole thing, you know, fails in compression. This isn't just a sort of crack. It, <laughs> when, you, when you fail one of these cylinders, this is dramatic. We should do it just for, I've got one. Hey, we could do it. You take them out. I don't think our testing machine's, machine's strong enough, though. You fail one of these things in compression, and you've got it. Goggles are not enough. You've got to have, like, goggles, a flak jacket, and you've got to stand back 30 feet. Because when that thing flies, it sends shrapnel everywhere. That concrete, it's a mess. You're, you're sweeping the floor for the next half hour to pick up all the little pieces of concrete because the thing, it just blows up. It's amazing. Well, <clears throat> and the higher strength concrete, the more brittle it is. It's like glass. You know, when, if, if you have glass and you break it, say you throw a brick at it, it doesn't just go bing. It shatters. Right? It, 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 things that are brittle when they fail, they fail pretty catastrophically usually. So if concrete fails, it's catastrophic. You've got the floor exploding. You've got, uh, is this not where you want to be? So you don't want that to happen. You don't want to be here. So as a safe range, you've got to go at least 25% back from, from balance. You know, reduce balance by 25%. This is, means taking out 25% steel from the balance point, right? Reducing it so that you're, this is pushing it, this is reducing the steel, uh, pushing it back to a range where the steel's definitely going to fail first. You're making the steel deliberately weaker so that the steel fails for you. say, oh, well, that's hardly fair. I'm making my, I could make my beam stronger just by putting more. Yeah, you could make it stronger, but it would not be safe. It would just not be, uh, if it ever did fail, you'd not be happy. Uh, especially if you were the one that was on it. Um, so this is between here, the minimum, and here, the maximum. This is the safe range. This is the calculation for balance that we'll look at in a second. Anything beyond balance, where you've got more steel than balance, this is putting in more steel, that's definitely not safe. That's definitely not safe. There's only one exception to this, and that is you can kind of get around, you can push the steel a little bit beyond this, but the way you do it is you put steel in the top. You have to reinforce the top as well as the bottom. And you may, you may come across beams that are what they call doubly reinforced. They have steel in the top and steel in the bottom. And by doing that, you can uh, essentially, whatever you add to the top, you can add more in the bottom and push it up higher like that and get a very strong section. Uh, and it, it, in the steel in the top, does prevent it from exploding. So that's kind of a trick. But the, usually then you, you have a, you can only go so far with that. I mean, you can only put so much steel in a beam before. It's just that you might as well use a steel beam. OK, this, if you look, this has got a new figure in it, beta, beta 1. And in uh, ultimate strength design, we have that, that lovely little Greek character. That, that didn't show up before. And what beta is doing, uh, it accounts for the difference in what is a, the real s uh, stress distribution in the beam. This is a, here, turn the light on a second. If I have a, if I have a, a beam like this, okay, you imagine a beam, and it's got this, and it's got a neutral axis, and now, if I try to draw the, the stress on this, let's say the neutral axis is like that, OK? Uh, where am I going to draw this? The real stress distribution is that first one. 
the real stress is kind of like this. And there's actually even a little bit of tensile stress there. So th this is you know, kind of a three-dimensional picture here. This is the, once it's down here, this is in tension, right? This is in compression. So, so we disregard any, any tensile stress. And you've got, a, you've got a picture like this, a distribution. Um, with working stress design and with any other uh, beam, the usual assumption is that you've got, you've got a linear distribution, remember? This would be like wood or steel. Here's, oops, compression and tension. This is what we usually see. This is, this is the way concrete is, really at ultimate. And what you have is, is basically a picture of this that's been turned on its side because, it, and it makes sense, these are the strains. You've got increasing strain, right? The strains are still, this is stress, not strain. The strain is still linear. The strain may be like this. And, and because the strains, the strains going off on this scale, the corresponding stresses are, are this picture. That's what this picture is. So it, it maps right onto this. And the, the, this curve from the concrete is actually the stress distribution in the beam. Well, <clears throat> it's not linear. That's why we can't use MC over I. It would also be, if we use this real parabolic curve in the calculations, that would be a nightmare. Because that parabolic curve would change with every uh, grade of concrete. You know, every, you know, these different grades of concrete are looking like this, maybe a lower grade down here. These are different strengths, right? This may be uh, 10,000, this may be uh, 4,000, or whatever the scale is, you know, 2,000 down here. Uh, they're, they're different grades of concrete, so you'd have a different, a different picture. In fact, you do, though, you actually do, but it'd be difficult to, to uh, calculate. So what they, what they do, is they say, okay, say we have this, there's going to be a, a resultant, a compressive resultant uh, for that, that parabolic stress block. All we really want in the end is that arrow. We're not going, when we do the calculations, we're going to do it by the couple method, uh, which I think we did with, uh, didn't we do that with something? I can't remember what. Something. <laughs> anyway, oh, even the uh, working stress design, I think we did one with the couple method. Well, this couple method is exclusively the way you do it with ultimate strength because it, it gets, you no longer use MC over I. You use <coughs> the, the uh, force times a, uh, a moment arm here. This is the moment arm down to the other, the other force. Um, so you just, need this, you just need this force and you need its location. You don't need to know anything about the, the, the curvature there. So what's, what's done is they, they came up with an equivalent rectangle, and that you what you do is you pretend you pretend this is a this is a total fiction here, but but this arrow I should have drawn the arrow on over here. This arrow matches exactly where the, the centroid would be here. These arrows line up; they would line up, and you just make this this block be whatever it has to be so that those arrows do line up, and then this arrow is dead in the center since that's a rectangle it would be dead in the center of that block. So you can almost imagine how you might calculate it backwards. You'd say, okay, take the real distribution, find the, the centroid of it, trace it over here, there it is. Now make a rectangle that has this as the center, right? And that rectangle comes out looking like that. It's actually <coughs> shorter than the neutral axis. It has to be shorter because look, this is always top heavy. It's top heavy up here. So that pulls this up. And the more top heavy it is, the more, because see, some of these are even more top heavy than others, uh, the more that, that goes up, the bigger this gap gets here. And this gap, or, or this, this length, the size of this, is defined by this beta factor. That's what beta does. So you take this distance, multiply it by a factor that we'll call beta, and that gives you this new distance. And that new distance, th this kind of, uh, fictitious distance uh, we call A. That's given that. So these, oh here you can turn the lights back off. Um, so that's what beta is. And because, because the uh, <coughs> curves vary with the, the different strengths of concrete, then beta also has to, to vary with F prime C. So for lower strength, it's, it's uh, 0.85, right? 
But as you get higher strengths, it gets lower, which pulls this up. You make this lower, this gets shorter, right? And this goes up. So it's the higher strength concrete uh, is more top heavy here. And, and this gets the little equivalent rectangle gets smaller. So it's all it may, the, <clears throat> pretending that this is a rectangle makes the calculation much easier. And it's equivalent. It's the same because we just look at this arrow in the end. It's exactly the same. We never really, uh, except for defining where that arrow is, we don't have to know that it's this parabolic shape. OK, so how the equations set out. This is, this is, how, they, this is how they play out. This is the, uh, the actual uh, stress block. This is the, the, what we call the ACI equivalent. This is the American Concrete Institute that came up with this method. So this is, this is their uh, stress distribution. And you can see you can define everything pretty neatly. You assume that the steel fail, uh, that the steel reaches yield. OK, so there's the yielding steel. That's the, the tensile amount. This is at failure. Uh, and this, this is going to reach its uh, capacity, F prime C. This, this, is, this little factor here, this 0.85 is not beta. This is beta over here. This is this one. This is point. It happens to be the same number, but it has no relationship. That 0.85 is in there just to account for the fact that <coughs> this cylinder, when you test it to get eight, uh, F prime C, you test it like this. But in the beam, it's actually like this uh, because the, the beam is cast uh, this way, right? So that this is the top of the beam. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the compression direction in the beam, right? At the top, it's compressed. At the top of the beam, it's compressed horizontally, not vertically. This would be a column. This would be a beam. So you test it as a column, but you're actually looking at it as a beam, and there's a difference there. There's also that 0.85 is also a reduction because the, the quality of the concrete at the top of the beam is always a little worse. The bubbles float up there, and it's always a little bit not quite as good at the top which is a pity. It would be nice if you could cast them upside down and then flip them over, but it doesn't work usually. Uh, so anyway, so that's 8 point. Eight point this, then is then the, this then is the volume of this rectangle. This is the, this dimension, 0.85 F prime C. There's A, that dimension, and B is back into the, the board, the one you don't see. B is the width. B is this one. Whoops, that one, which is turned at 90 degrees. So that's the volume of that stress block, which gives you C. Now you've got C and you've got T. C and T are the only two horizontals. They've got to be equal. They're the couple. That's the internal couple. They're the, they're the couple that's, that's producing the moment. I mean, think about it. If you had you know, any sort of a beam and you, you know, this is a cantilever, so it's reversed, but if I push it on the bottom and pull it on the top, that produces the moment that holds it up, right? There's the twisting. The flexure is a twisting, and that's the internal twist that, that resists the, the uh, twist caused by the external loading. So there you've got the internal couple. You set the, those equations. You've got these equations up there, so you can substitute their values in there. And then that becomes the basic equation for all the concrete calculations. You can solve from this. You can solve for A, this little number here, which is kind of an interesting thing to do. You could also uh, substitute rho in there and get this equation. You know, substitute A, S, B, D. Somewhere you get a D in there. I don't know where that comes. Oh, you have to add the, you have to multiply the D in there. There it then shows up there. Uh, and this would be in terms of rho. There are other equations. This is for the strength moment would be the, the uh, couple here. This C times this distance, Z, is what it's usually called. Or it's D. This is D, right? All this full distance here is D. And this, this little part up here is A over 2, right? This is A, and this is right in the middle, so that's A over 2. So D minus A over 2 is the moment arm times T gives you the moment. So that, that would expand like that. Or you could look at it the other way around. You could take this times the moment arm. Do I have that one up there? 
No, oh, too bad. That would be another possibility. Uh, <clears throat> so that you get very relatively simply expressed equations for that internal couple. And the, the moment, this, this is the strength then, the internal strength, it gets a phi factor, that's the, the safety factor for the strength, and, and is equated to the uh, external moment caused by the loads. So this would be the WL squared over eight, right? So those, this you can, you know, you can take pieces, these are all just ex expansions of the same formula. You can substitute this, this there into that and get this equation, or you can, you know, has phi in it, you can substitute then, oh, for A, I guess, we've substituted some of this, pulled that over there and rewritten it like that, pulled the D outside. So you get different equations that might be useful in design. All right, I think we'll stop there. This is the explanation. I'd wanted to get through that, but that's all right.